All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi guys, this is uh, Tal Lee. Uh, nice to have you folks uh, on board for our webinar tonight. Uh, this is uh, our uh, Path to 250 webinar, we talk, how we talk about you know, getting the score that you need uh, on your US only Step 1 uh, exam. Uh, so uh, I am an assistant, associate clinical professor of medicine and pediatrics at the University of Louisville. I'm also uh, chief of the section of allergy immunology there. Um, but obviously, you folks know me better as the, the senior author and editor for first aid for the use like step one, step two, CK, step three, a bunch of other first aid books, as well as the chief education officer for USMRX, our question banks, videos, flashcards, and ScholarX, our digital brick system. Uh, so, uh, you know, obviously do a lot of education uh, and really, ha uh, really fortunate to have a, a number of excellent panelists with us tonight. I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves. Uh, the first one is Sean. Sean, would you introduce yourself? Hi, guys. Sean Nanji here. I've uh, been with Scholar Rx, helping with our new Rx Coach project, which I'm sure will be mentioned later. Always love being a part of these webinars, and I look forward to answering your questions. Great. And our other panelist is uh, Paras. Yeah, hi, everyone. I am uh, one of the Rx tutors. I'm a dermatology resident at UT Southwestern. Um, I've been with the group for a few months um, and I'm happy to be here to help answer questions. Great, fantastic. Great. Just a little bit of audio. And so just FYI, uh, both Sean and Pras uh, will be happy to answer any questions you have about preparing for the use link step one and so forth, about coaching and tutoring and stuff like that. Um, there is a question and uh, uh, answer panel on the right side of your screen if you're using a PC or a Mac. If you're a tablet or your iPhone or smartphone, uh, there should be a, uh, in the menu bar, there should be an, a, the ability to ask questions as well too. So they will do their best to uh, um, uh, provide you with, uh, uh, you know, uh, with specific answers to your questions um, as I do my webinar. Uh, there are certain things that just FY, they may not be able to answer. Like for example, that you know, you know, they can't make a specific recommendation for what's the best X resource for you, you know, that type of stuff. With that, not without knowing you better, you know, you know, uh, or 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 how to prepare. But obviously, if you want to get a hold of them, you know, you can certainly, you know, you get in touch with them through our X Rx Coach Service, which I'll tell you a little bit about later how to get a hold of them. Uh, and, uh, you know, um, and so, uh, but again, you know, we'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can. Know. Tonight, we know that there's hundreds of you guys out there, so uh, we'll we'll do our best to, to stay ahead of all that. All right. So the first thing we think about, uh, um, uh, we want to think about when preparing for the US only Step One is actually relaxing. That may sound like the that, that may be sound like the last thing you're going to do in the world, right? Relax when you're preparing for the exam. Uh, but you know that's true. We we really want you to think, be you know, take a deep breath, uh, you know, uh, and, and be deliberate about how you want to prepare for the exam, what you want to get out of the exam, uh, and, um, and so that you get the best results uh, on exam day. Uh, and, you know, and in fact, this is the number, this is the first word that you read in first aid for the USA step one. This has been the first word for the last 30 editions. All right, so what are we going to cover in the next, uh, you know, hour or so? So we're going to, uh, um, uh, you know, um, uh, go through the basics here. Uh, we're going to be defining your goals, timelines for studying. Uh, in the middle, you know, you know, uh, 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 particularly with the goals, we're going to address the upcoming changes uh, in 2022 for the U.S. Wing Step One and the U.S. Wing Series, and what how that might impact you. Uh, we'll talk about timelines for studies and approaching subjects, uh, prep resources, some additional advice. Uh, we're going to let you know about uh, our experts and our coach, uh, some of our new. Uh, new new uh, new services this year, and we'll actually raffle off some of the coaching sessions and, and bricks as well as our Q Bank and all that stuff uh, at the very end as well too. So you hang on for all that. We'll get to all that good stuff. And by the way, if you want to win, you got to be there for the uh, you know uh, when when we call out your name. So do stick around. And then at that after that, we'll we'll have some hopefully some time for some uh, Q and A. All right. So uh, I want to. I want to learn about who's out there tonight. I know there's a bunch of you folks, and uh, um, uh, and, and you guys are always a diverse group. So I want to know who's out there. So I'm going to open up a poll, and I'm going to 
ask what type of student are you uh, or physician are you? So uh, are you a US uh, or a US allopathic or osteopathic student? Are you an IMG or uh, an international student? If you are, were you born in the US or were you born internationally? So um, we'll, we'll leave this poll open uh, for a couple of seconds. It does take a while for the results to tabulate um, just because there's so many folks out there. Uh, and so um, we'll, we'll give it a little bit of time. We'll, get, we'll wait till like, we get to maybe uh, two thirds of the folks polling out there. Um, let's see, we're up to 60%. Uh, we're climbing our way up. Um, looks like we are now at 70%, so fantastic. I will close the poll and share the results. And uh, what we see here is that uh, um, we, uh, the majority of our participants tonight are from outside the United States um, and internationally born. We have a fair amount of IMGs also that are uh, US born, so that may be in the Caribbean. Uh, and, we, uh, and we still have quite a number of US students in North America as well too. And so I know you folks are from all over the place. And, um, uh, and you know, in the past when I've asked what countries you guys are from, I, I think I've gotten a list of like 30, 50, 30, 40, 50 countries. Uh, so I, I really appreciate uh, anybody who, uh, who, who, who's logging in from Asia or Europe or Africa, because I know it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a different hour for you guys. Um, the next, uh, okay, NYIT is on the line, so that's cool. Uh, all right, uh, shout out to you guys. Uh, um, the next poll I'm going to ask is I want to know when you want to play when you want to plan to take the step one this is a very important question because we'll uh, this will help us talk a little bit about some of the US wind changes a little bit later so um, I need to know whether you are uh, um, taking the exam um, really soon uh, or uh, in April or June or July through 2021 or 2022 and beyond. I'll give you guys a couple of seconds to answer that. We've had about half of you folks answering that, but I'll, I'll leave it out a little bit uh, uh, longer. And looks like we've got about 75% of the people responding. All right, so I'm gonna close the poll. I'm going to show the results, and you can see that the bulk of the folks are going to be taking the boards in the next uh, several months. So, so some of you guys are taking it very, very, very soon. Uh, the majority, uh, a big show, 40% of you will be taking in April and June, uh, April through June. So you know before the uh, before the end of the academic year, uh, the most of the rest of you folks are going to be taking it, uh, you know, sometime between July and end of 2021, and a couple of you folks are going to be taking it in 2022 or beyond. So uh, thinking way, way ahead. Um, all right, great. And so we'll talk about the ramifications uh, in just a bit. All right, so I'm going to hide those results and get back to the presentation. All right, so let's talk about the exam itself. All right, uh, for those of your folks uh, um, who are taking it very soon, you're probably already familiar with this, so I'll keep it short. Uh, this is a one day exam, eight hours total. Uh, there's 280 questions in seven one-hour blocks, so that you know obviously divides out to 40 questions per block, and you get a minimum of 45 minutes of break time. Uh, and so this is just a very simple schematic. You'll see that obviously there's a there's a, a a a block here for orientation. I'll talk a little bit about it. You've got your seven blocks here for the exam, and somewhere in the middle you'll be taking snacks and so forth. Um, the uh, 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 the trick is you are allotted 15 minutes for this orientation block. If you uh, if you actually do this block ahead of time, you can you can actually uh, download this block uh, um, as part of your US only orientation uh, download. And uh, if you go through it uh, beforehand, and then when you get to the Prometric Exam Center and you go through it again, just to adjust your audio for your headphones for the handful of multimedia questions, and you just take 30 seconds, 40 seconds to do that, that'll essentially give you another 15 minutes of break time. So you'll have close to an hour of break time. On top of that, if you finish any of these blocks early, you know, uh, you're, you're given a, up to an hour for each of these blocks, but you finish any of these blocks early uh, and you exit, um, then the leftover time also goes towards your break time. Uh, so you should, at the end of the day, hopefully have plenty of break time for 
snacks, uh, restroom breaks, and uh, so forth. All right, great. So let's talk about the question types. So uh, on the USMLE, uh, um, there's only really one question type, and that's the single best answer. Uh, so that means it'll be uh, there'll be a case vignette or a stem with a, you know a number of choices, and you're going to choose the best of those choices. There's going to be no negative phrase questions. There's going to be no multiple choice choice questions or what's called K-type questions. Um, you know, uh, a handful of these questions will have multimedia. We'll talk about how to handle that later. Almost all the questions have some sort of or some sort of clinical vignette or case scenario. So that's you know 85, 90 percent of the exam, and uh, you know a, a, a big chunk of the questions uh, will have multi-step reasoning. Uh, so that means they have uh, you know uh, you know multiple uh, clinical uh, basic science concepts uh, that they're fusing together uh, to put together a scenario that they test you on. So here's a very simple example of a two-step question. So this is a 32-year-old uh, Caucasian woman who presents with a five-day history of occasional double vision uh, and uh, bilateral ptosis. And uh, the, the exam goes on to ask, what is the most appropriate uh, diagnostic test? So again, you'll, you'll, you'll notice that this is, uh, you know, this, is, this is more than one step, right? Because it's actually not asking what the diagnosis is. Um, it gives you a case, and of course, you're, you're trying to figure that out. So, uh, um, which is, uh, what's the diagnosis? But then to be able to ask, answer what's the most appropriate diagnostic test, which ultimately what's what they want to know, you know, uh, you know, you have to go through that first step, right? So uh, step one, make the diagnosis. Step two, you know, what's the diagnostic test? So in this particular case, uh, with a young woman, um, uh, Caucasian, uh, who has these bilateral symmetric findings, um, you're probably dealing with something like myasthenia uh, gravis. Uh, you could argue for multiple sclerosis, um, but that typically has unilateral findings. Uh, it has a predilection for uh, African-American women, though it does happen in Caucasian women as well too, and men. Uh, so in this particular case, you know, the classic, uh, you know, uh, the, the classic diagnostic test for myasthenia gravis um, is uh, edrophonium. Uh, which is a short-acting acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. Uh, in the United States, it has largely been supplanted by anti-acetylcholinesterase antibody assays. Uh, Idrophonium may be used in other parts of the world. Uh, so that's an example how uh, the U.S. link can set up a, um, uh, a multi-step question. Uh, and uh, uh, you may run into three-step questions uh, where it starts off with a clinical diagnosis, uh, then you have to figure out what the, the the treatment is, and then you have to then you have to figure out what the side of, the primary side effect of that uh, drug is. Um, you may have uh, problem solving questions where they give you some statistics uh, and some uh, some population numbers, and you have to figure out the sensitivity or the specificity. So there's a number of ways where they can uh, force you to apply information and not just do rote memorization recall. All right, so this is how the interface uh, uh, looks like. Uh, and you can see here, um, uh, uh, you've got your, your question, your, your, your case, uh, which in US only terminology is called the stem, and, uh, and then followed by the question in this case, which is the most following is the most likely diagnosis. So that's the lead in. Uh, you've got your choices and, uh, uh, and distractors. There's a minimum of four choices. Sometimes you can get five, six, or seven choices. Uh, and about 15 to 20% of the time, uh, you will have some sort of visual information that goes along with the question. Uh, you know what? You notice at the top that you've got your navigation, uh, lab values, you can take notes, you've got a calculator. You also have some navigation along the side as well, too. And then you've got the block timer uh, and then the timer for the rest of the day. Um, you notice that you can also lock the exam if you need to go use the restroom or walk away from the, the computer, but the timer will, will run the, you know, the entire time. You cannot stop that timer. Um, you can change any, uh, the answers to any questions in the block while you're inside the block. But once you exit the block, you cannot re-enter the block and uh, change your answer uh, to any of those questions. All right. So let's talk about the scoring and the passing rates. 
So passing is 194. It's been that way for a couple of years and there's no change for the short term, but we'll talk about what's gonna happen in 2022. Uh, the mean is currently at around uh, 229. Uh, standard deviation has been stable at 20. Uh, for allopathic uh, medical students and osteopathic medical students, uh, 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 most will pass on the first try and virtually everyone passes uh, within three tries. If you're an IMG, whether you are um, born in the United States or born outside the United States, uh, the pass rates are very similar. They're in the 80, 80% 80 on uh, range. Uh, you know, come, it, it varies, goes up and down uh, uh, for the first time attempt. Uh, but, you know, in our experience, uh, you know, greater than 90% uh, uh, of international medical graduates will pass within three tries. All right. So as I promised, okay, well, and we'll talk about the U.S. only percentiles. Uh, and um, we do have uh, this uh, information in, in first date, and you can see that uh, um, that uh, the uh, uh, the uh, um, uh, uh, that the percentile that at 250, that's roughly about you know 85 percent. So that's one standard deviation, and uh, you can see that the percentile for uh, um, for passing is around 5%. All right, so we are uh, going to talk about defining your goals. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, uh, um, we try to keep it simple. Uh, um, uh, you know, so obviously everybody wants to pass. And, uh, um, and so passing is, uh, would be comfortably above 194 and uh, up to the mean. For us, beating the mean would be obviously anything uh, at 230 or above, uh, up to one standard deviation, and at 250 plus, you're one standard deviation above 85 percentile. Uh, and you know, as we all know, uh, the 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 reason why some of us need to think about uh, scoring well on the exam is if we're if we are interested in any of these uh, very competitive uh, specialties. Uh, so um, here's our mnemonic for that. Uh, uh, road to riches uh, includes radiology, radiation oncology, uh, the surgical subspecialties, uh, the, the, the three big O's in use, so uh, ortho, opto, uh, otolaryngology, which is what my brother did, urology, uh, aesthetics, which is uh, plastics, uh, and then dermatology, which, which is what uh, uh, a Paras did. Uh, and so, as you know, they do use this uh, uh, step one as a, a screening uh, tool. Uh, for uh, residency uh, interviews. Uh, but one thing that you want to keep in mind is that once you get your interview, um, the, the factors of it, like your, the actual interview, your dean's letters, your uh, uh, clerkship honors and stuff like that uh, tend to become more important, even, even more than the step one. So you have to realize that the step one is important, but up to a certain level. All right, as I mentioned, I, I, I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about the upcoming U.S. money changes. You may have heard about it. You may have seen things on Reddit and tons and tons of speculation. Uh, you know, I'll stick with the facts. Uh, I will talk a little bit about what I think it may mean uh, um, and, what, uh, uh, and so forth. So, um, so the, uh, the uh, FSNB, NBME, uh, um, in, with the support of other organizations, uh, you know, have made a decision that, uh, you know, uh, that the U.S. only step one will go pass fail sometime in 2022. We don't know exactly when they haven't announced that. And so I, I've got I've got this these two words boldface, and I'll explain why that's really important in a second. Uh, step two CK and step three will remain numeric. It also has a pass fail adjective, um, uh, but you know, th for now they will retain uh, the uh, three-digit scaled score. Uh, they will also reduce the uh, maximum attempts that you can uh, take the exam from six to four for each step. So um, this will take effect in January. Uh, sometime, or, I'm sorry, this will take effect next year sometime. We don't know when, all right? It could be as early as January or later. Uh, <clears throat> so that's, uh, and then finally, uh, they are now gonna require step one passing before you can actually take the step two CS. And again, that will uh, take effect uh, sometime in uh, March, 2021, again, or later. And remember, these, 
they, they, they reserve the right to delay these, uh, these things. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll address these two minor changes first before going into the pass fail. Uh, so, you know, um, this may, this is largely not going to affect U.S. medical students for the most part because the majority of the schools there uh, generally limit the maximum attempts to about three. You, you, you obviously need to check with your deans, uh, your, 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 um, your registrar's office, uh, but for in U.S. schools, it's typically about three. If you're an IMG, uh, and you're going through the ECFMG pathway, uh, this, uh, um, this can impact you um, because, you, you, uh, because uh, ECFMG doesn't, uh, doesn't have its own limits. And so it's, it's really what uh, USMLE does, all right? Um, step one uh, may, again, also um, uh, impact, uh, um, you know, intermediate graduate. For US, yeah, for US medical students, essentially no change because uh, you know uh, most schools will not let you take the uh, CS anyway if you don't pass the step one because you won't be able to get to your clinical clerkships without passing the step one right they'll, they'll force you to sit out until you pass your step one um, for IMGs up to this point you could take all the exams in just about any order uh, um, uh, um, so this might impact uh, IMGs a, a little bit but again most IMGs uh, if they do take something out of order, they'll usually take, they may take, you may take the step two CK first, then the step one, uh, but because the step two CS is such an expensive exam and you have to fly to the United States or you have to be in the United States, at, you know, at the time, you know, uh, uh, the most, you know, the majority of you, uh, it shouldn't have impact the majority of you. So, um, uh, you know, so I would say hopefully a minimum impact there. Now with regards to the actual pass fail. So, um, so, you know, what's going to happen and, and how's it going to impact you? So, ta-da, a little anticlimactic, but for most of you, there will be no impact. And what, uh, and, and that, that includes, uh, that includes, I can confidently say 95% of you folks on tonight's webinar. As you noticed, 95% of you will be taking the US Link Step 1 or is, or is planning to take the US Link Step 1 before 2022. Uh, so, uh, you, you have to prepare for the exam exactly as the exam is given now, which is a numeric exam. Uh, the exam will, of course, always, you know, evolve. The pass fail threshold may change in the next couple of years, uh, but it will have a numeric uh, um, uh, score at least through December of 2021 and potentially beyond. So, you have to, you have to uh, um, prepare for the worst case scenario and prepare for that. So again, you know, we'll talk later more about how to do that, of course, uh, but you know, that, that should be the attitude you take. Um, unless you're not gonna take you know, the, the exam until middle of 2022 or later, uh, you know, um, you know, you know, that's what you need to do. Um, obviously, if you're gonna be taking the exam you know, uh, later in 2022 or 2023, you may be looking to prepare more strongly for the US Link Step 2 CK. Uh, you know, by, by the time 2024 rolls around with regards to, um, uh, you, know, uh, um, you know, matches and so forth, you know, uh, Red CC programs may be using that as a screening tool. Uh, but again, you know, if you're really actually preparing now, uh, um, you're, if you're actually starting to prepare now or you're thinking about preparing now, I, I, even if you're not taking the exam until, until 2022, the, the 5% of you guys that are out there in gals, I would still, I would still prepare for the US Link Step 1 because you don't know if it's going to be January 2022 that they're going to flip the switch or June 2022 that they're going to flip the switch. They won't tell us, not at least for a little while. So um, beyond that, it's pure speculation. Um, you know, the, the other things I'll, I'll, I'll you know, I'll, I'll just editorialize just a little bit on is, you know, there, there was, you know, uh, you know, one of the reasons why, uh, why a number of folks really wanted uh, US Lane to go past fail is because of the stress level and, and, and so forth. Uh, because the USMLE or the NBB ended up splitting the baby, step one went past fail and step two did not. You know, I'm not 100% sure that it actually reduces stress uh, for students uh, or even, you know, IMGs. Uh, um, because there's still, uh, you know, there's still that uh, that high stakes exam out there that that residency programs are going to be used. And so, uh, 
uh, whether step one or step two, um, you know, students are still going to be preparing, you know, awfully, awfully hard for this. You know, I, I you know, to me, if, if I were to go to the root cause, I, you know, I, you know, I would say that uh, the challenge has been that, you know, we need more residency slots, uh, you know, you know, both for students and IMGs. And, uh, you know, that's been the, the, the you know, that's been a, a challenge. Um, we, we, we're graduating plenty of medical students and we have plenty of IMGs that are interested in, in becoming good doctors here, but we need more slots. And so that's, that's only something that the federal government can do. And ha it's beyond the control of people like the NBME and, and, and uh, you know, that type of stuff. Um, so, you know, that's, that's my bit of an editorial. Um, so anyway, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, but again, back to the bottom line about preparing for the US only, for 95% of you, uh, you know, it's not gonna affect too much. All righty, we're gonna keep on going. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the, the, the statistics about how the US only step one uh, is related to uh, uh, matching outcomes. Uh, this is uh, data with regards to U.S. seniors. Uh, what you'll notice here is that, yes, indeed, uh, um, you know, those who match uh, in those competitive specialties like diagnostic radiology and so forth, you know, um, you know have higher scores, uh, uh, median scores in the 240s. Uh, um, but the good news is that if you're interested in any, you know, any of the broader specialties, family medicine, pediatrics, internal medicine, which is what I did before I went to allergy, uh, you know, um, as long as you're in median, you know, uh, as long as you're in the, the range of here, uh, you, you should be competitive and you shouldn't be screened out. Um, the other thing that I want to uh, point out, uh, um, and this is, this is for the, uh, um, the U.S. medical students, and I know that's a minority who's on our call tonight. Uh, if you look at the median probability of matching into a preferred specialty, uh, as long as, as uh, you know, uh, you're a U.S. medical student that's interested in, in the other specialties, I'm talking internal medicine, pediatrics, emergency medicine, even if you perform poorly, this is very, very old data, they don't even uh, do this uh, graph anymore, uh, you know, in the, uh, in the NRMP, uh, National Residency Matching Program uh, statistics, uh, you'll, you'll still have a high probability of matching into a specialty. If you're a U.S. senior and you want to do something very competitive like laryngology, you can see there's kind of a steep uh, dose response curve. But even if you do, you know, back in the day when the average was something like around 220 uh, or uh, 215, uh, you still had a 50-50 chance. Um, uh, uh, if you're an IMG, uh, uh, you know, chances are, uh, uh, are, are going to be a little bit lower uh, even for the, 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 the big uh, primary care specialties. So again, just to, you know, just to kind of show the relative differences here. All right, so um, I threw a lot of numbers at you there. So I'm gonna pause. I wanna ask a question, uh, which is, um, uh, uh, what is your US Wing Step 1 goal? Now that uh, now you have a little bit more information, do you wanna pass comfortably? Do you wanna ace the exam? Or do you wanna beat the average? And again, remember, there is no right or wrong answer. Uh, uh, you know, so a lot of it is tied to your goal and if you're very interested in the very competitive especially and also if you're an IMG. All right, about 30 folks have uh, answered. I'm going to keep it going for a little while longer. All right, two-thirds have answered, uh, three-quarters have answered. I'll just wait a few more seconds. All right, so I'm going to close the poll and share it. As you can see here, two thirds of you folks do want to do really well, ace the exam, uh, you know, and uh, um, about a third want to beat the average and, and a handful just want to pass comfortably. And again, there's no right or wrong answer. It really depends on your circumstances. Again, if you're an IMG, you generally do want to do well, uh, you know, uh, to not be screened out, uh, even for primary care uh, um, um, residencies. All right, I'm going to... Uh, uh, hide the poll and move on to the next slide. So uh, in first aid, uh, we talk about uh, a couple of schedule approaches um, for, uh, you know, uh, medical students, U.S. medical students, uh, you know, um, especially if you just want to pass, um, 
Yeah, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's quite appropriate to, to do a shorter dedicated study schedule of one to two months with uh, first aid as a, a framework for organizing your study and then focusing on the crimeable subjects and doing a couple of question banks. And we'll talk about the data behind why it's more than just one question bank. Uh, if you want to do better, or if you're an IMG, or if you've had challenges with standardized exams in the past, uh, you might want to consider all the above. Obviously, all the other, uh, uh, you know, all the other subject areas, uh, domain areas, and multiple question banks. Um, there's no, again, no right or wrong answer, uh, but these are just a couple of general approaches uh, that students and IMGs have tended to take in the past. And we do actually have a study planner uh, um, that can guide you through this. Fortunately, I don't think I have the, the link, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll might try to uh, get to it a little bit later. If uh, uh, Jeff, if you drop it in the, the chat box, um, we, we can show at the very end. All right, uh, choosing your study strategies. Uh, you know, um, uh, the good news is that you have taken standardized exams in the past. So to some extent you do, uh, you, you do have some learning preferences and some preparation preferences that you can fall back on. That otherwise, you need to understand the structure and characteristics of subject. Um, for example, uh, pharmacology and microbiology you know, tends to lend itself well to flashcards because there's a, a lot of associations that come up regularly. Uh, you, know, they can, you can also use tables for that. Uh, whereas pathology, or whereas physiology is more about the relationship. And so sometimes you might uh, you know, map those out or, uh, or, or diagram those things out. Uh, you need to also know the study, the structure and characteristics of your uh, curriculum. So uh, if your curriculum covered microbiology well in a very high yield fashion, you may be able to spend less time in terms of your dedicated prep. If not, then you're going to have to, you know, do that with QBanks and Sketchy Micro and stuff like that. Uh, and then finally, time assigned to a particular subject or system, right? If you are dedicating three weeks of study period, I'm sorry, uh, if you're gonna uh, put 30, three weeks of dedicated study time to something like pathology, you'll be able to use a number of different approaches. But if you're just doing, say, neural anatomy, you're probably gonna just use, uh, do maybe one to two days of uh, dedicated study. If, if you only have like, say, four to six weeks off between the end of the semester in your exam, uh, so you're going to be uh, uh, you'll you'll uh, uh, you'll be using uh, uh, fewer techniques, uh, maybe just uh, going through some review resources and some QBank questions, and maybe some flashcards and stuff like that. Uh, so again, it, it just depends. If you're an IMG, you may have a lot more time, especially if you've already graduated, uh, and uh, um, uh, you you can assign weeks to anything, and so you'll have uh, a lot more flexibility. All right. So in the next um, five to 10 minutes. I'm gonna go through this pretty quick. Uh, I'm gonna you know, just highlight some of the high yield uh, areas in each of these disciplines. Uh, 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 I'll show you where to uh, get the, uh, these slides so that you don't have to take some, so many notes. And because we spent a lot of time talking about the usually changes, I wanna be able to save some time here and uh, you know, uh, be able to answer some questions at the very end. Uh, and you'll, you'll pick up some patterns as well too. Uh, so the first thing you'll notice is that, um, you know, uh, whether it's anatomy or pathology or whatnot, anything that's clinically relevant tends to be more testable. Uh, you know, uh, you know, it's a bit of a misnomer that the, the first date step one is quote unquote a basic science exam. It is technically. However, uh, what if they try, what they're trying to do is they often tie it to something that's clinically relevant. So in a way, it's also clinical. So think about um, think about you know uh, you know what might happen if you have a spiral fracture of the humerus. Uh, you think about the the nerve that runs through the humeral groove, and if that uh, groove was severe, they may ask you what would be the motor and sensory deficit you know from that particular injury. Um, in terms of uh, you know clinical imaging, uh, it's going to be it's uh, in terms of cross-sectional anatomy, it's going to be clinical. Uh, so they're not going to be giving you cadaveric anatomy. They're going to be showing x-rays, CTs, MRIs. And on the histology side, you know, photomicrographs, you know, H&E stains, uh, you know, electron micrographs, and so forth. So again, it's, you know, they're going to try to ask um, questions that, are, that have some sort of clinical relevance uh, most of the time. 
biochemistry, again, uh, things that have some sort of clinical relevance, vitamin deficiencies, di uh, diseases with uh, genetic errors or metabolic syndromes where there's some sort of issue with key reg regulatory enzymes. All right, and this is one of the, you know, three crammable disciplines. We'll talk about, you know, why that matters in a little bit. Uh, microbiology is also crammable as well, too. Uh, uh, the, the key mistake, however, that some students will make and IMGs make is they focus so much on bacteriology that they forget that all, all the other stuff like virology, parasitology, and immunology. All right. Uh, again, this tends to be crammable because the, uh, uh, the, the, the you know, it's, it's, you know, um, they're talking about recurring concepts. They're usually testing recurring concepts such as distinguished characteristics. Uh, you know, where, where does the bug go? How does it get there? How do you diagnose it? How do you treat it? What are the vectors? What are the reservoirs? And so these are predictable questions, um, you know, when it comes to um, micro, viro, virology, fungology, parasitology, and so forth. Um, with the immune response and immunology, you know, you got to understand how it actually works in real life, how it can be manipulated by vaccines, and how and what happens with immunodeficiency disorders, uh, which often gives a very special window in terms of how uh, uh, you know, uh, you know the the immune system works and what happens when it breaks down. All right, pathology is very very big, uh, especially if you want to do well on the exam. Um, the, the 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 good news is that they tend to uh, stick to the hallmark characteristics of uh, of the disorders, especially if it's a rare disorders. If it's a uh, something that's very common, like diabetes or asthma you may see a significant variation in the presentation. Um, such, for example, in an asthma, you may be uh, just you presented with a kid that's just coughing. And coughing is, is, is often a, uh, the only symptom you may get in a kid who has a, a, a asthma or something similar like reactive airway disease. Um, uh, you, know, uh, you can often get some, uh, some clues from the, uh, the gender, age, ethnicity, and activity, they try not to uh, purposely throw you off the trail. Uh, that's called a red herring. That's actually considered a bad, you know, uh, bad form in terms of developing a test items. Uh, so, uh, you, know, um, uh, you know, so if it's an Ashkenazi Jew, if the patient's working in the uh, rose garden or the patient's eating fava beans, those can be clues. Now, just think about it though, however, that their relevance, their their the relevance may vary. So, uh, you know, but it's uh, um, uh, but uh, nevertheless, it's um, you know they can be helpful. The other things to know is that um, that the trigger words uh, are uh, or buzzwords that we often use as mnemonics. You might use them in first aid and any other audio resources. They're not necessarily going to show up on the exam because on the exam they're going to use neutral descriptions of that clinical manifestation or that syndrome uh, to describe it and not, not, all the, not all the slangy term stuff that we might use in first aid, that, that, which we use for mnemonics. So know how these things are described you know, in a neutral way. As I mentioned, most of the questions have, uh, um, you know, will have, I'm sorry, uh, uh, you know, some of the questions will have uh, photomicrographs, gross path, and this, that, and the other. The key thing here is that a lot of times, including the multimedia, these can be answered from the, the history alone without even looking at it. So, uh, you know, I, I often recommend that you read the stem first before you look at the antigen. And if you're that type of person that's just impatient, just cover it because uh, it's going to distract you, you know, you know, from reading and getting all the clues out of that, uh, you know, uh, out of that history. All right, pharmacology is also crammable. Um, you know, in addition to uh, biochemistry and micro, uh, because again, there are uh, there are common types of questions that they tend to answer, ask, which includes mechanism of action, clinical uses, uh, toxicity, drug drug events, you know that type of stuff. Uh, Prototypical drugs and the major variants are what you really want to know. If you want to get a higher score, then you of course want to focus on the minor variants as well too. And again, because it's about you know often about clinical treatment, uh, you're almost you're almost going to see these. Uh, often you're going to see them uh, associated with other, uh, 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 other, uh, uh, you know, disciplines, uh, uh, you know, uh, as a multi-step 
cl uh, clinical, clinical vignette question. All right. All right. Physiology. I mentioned again that that's tends to be concept oriented because it's really about the relationships, about you know how certain hormones or uh, um, or glands uh, impact each other. Uh, so uh, diagrams, as I mentioned, can work well in, in schematics, really in, in understanding all these various relationships. And again, it's, it tends to be tightly integrated with pathology a lot. So again, most of the time you'll see this with clinical vignettes. And then psychiatry uh, is a mix of psychology, sociology, psychopharmacology. Uh, we cover all these high yield areas, you know, inside of first aid, in addition to all the mood disorders. And then finally, uh, bio, uh, public health, um, it's uh, also kind of a heterogeneous mix of biostats, epi, uh, uh, ethics, and law. Uh, in the last couple of years, they've been putting more emphasis on healthcare delivery, population health, uh, or health system science, as people sometimes like to call. Uh, and so that also includes uh, other domain areas like patient safety and quality improvement. All right. And uh, biostats and epi is uh, also, uh, you know, high yield. Um, and um, uh, all right, so that's that. Now let's move on to uh, test, uh, tests and text reviews, um, or let's talk about review resources. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that you can use out there. There's, there's you know, books like First Aid, of course, uh, test banks like USNRX and UWorld, uh, question books, case reviews, review courses, apps, apps, and more apps um, for flashcards, for videos, uh, you know, online videos, uh, mobile apps, and all kinds of stuff. So there's literally hundreds of things that you can use. Uh, at the end of the day, you don't have all the time and you don't have also all the money in the world. Uh, so what are you going to do? Uh, well, fortunately, we run a survey every year. Uh, it goes out to U.S. medical students and to IMGs. Uh, and uh, uh, our, our student editorial team tabulates the results and make recommendations out of that. Uh, and so do check out those reviews and um, we provide these reviews for free on, first, uh, on our blog, firstateam.com. Uh, <clears throat> and it's also, of course, uh, rated in the book. Uh, so um, a couple of general pieces of advice. Uh, try to, if you're gonna commit to resource, try to use it along with your studies. Uh, um, whether it's a book, app, uh, or digital resource, try not to overbuy. There's plenty of things out there, uh, and we have a tendency to overwhelm ourselves with resources. Uh, and also within a series, like I say, say textbook series, some books are going to be better than others. Some some components of an app are going to be better, better than others. So you still need to be diligent about what you use and picky about you know what you use. All right. So I am going to ask another poll question, and uh, want to find out, you know, what are you going to be using to prepare for the useless step one? It could be all of the above or none of the above. So it's a question mix, review back books, flashcard, uh, mobile apps, videos. So I'll uh, give you guys a couple of seconds to answer. And thanks to Jeff for posting the links to the study planner and to our resource reviews. All right, looks like about a third of you guys have, uh, um, have answered. I'll keep it open for a little while longer. I know this, this poll takes a long, longer to do just because, you know, it's, it's tabulating every, every single, every single one of these clicks. All right. Three quarters of you guys have answered. I'm going to share the results here. And what you see is that uh, almost everyone uses uh, question banks. Most folks are using review books and videos. Quite a few of you guys are using flashcards and a growing number of you folks are using mobile apps. So um, there's all kinds of resources out there, all kinds of modalities, and they are all valid. All right, getting back to the presentation. So let's talk, uh, let's, let's, uh, uh, let's, uh, you know, um, review some general study advice, and I'm going to ask some, some of our RX coaches to chime in in just a little bit here. Uh, so uh, you, you want to, you know, um, you want to establish a study schedule uh, while ahead of time. Like I said, you can take advantage of, of our planner. Once you do, you, you got to try hard, uh, stick really uh, 
hard really stick, uh, try hard to stick with it. Sorry about that. Uh, especially, uh, especially if you follow all the rules, there's a couple things you want to keep in mind. You don't want to over schedule. You want to have time for breaks, exercise, uh, to, to be a human being. Uh, you want to um, uh, use our checklist uh, that's uh, at the front of the book. Uh, it's right before section one that will, you know, get, uh, especially if you're planning uh, months in advance, or in this case, years in advance, this will tell you what you need to do. Um, if you, uh, you know, you know, I will also add that, you know, with regards to scheduling time, I would try to schedule a, a week before the boards to keep just to, just to keep things free, uh, so that you can kind of go back and uh, and review anything you need to review and or do uh, you know extra questions, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, to keep to keep uh, self testing yourself. Um, and uh, take at least a day off uh, a, a week. Um, you know, so if you do that, you should actually have to adjust your schedule too much. Some other pieces of, 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 of advice that students in IMG, you know, have found useful over the years is integrate and apply everything. So you gotta think about how all these concepts relate to each other, because again, the US only wants you to apply it, and they also, you know, they often bring these concepts together. Remember all those multi-step questions. Uh, I've talked about those crammable subjects biochemistry, micro, and uh, pharmacology. Uh, now, again, uh, you know, there's multiple ways of putting together your schedule, um, and especially if you're still in medical school, uh, you, you often wanna, you know, uh, uh, you know align uh, your, you know, your, those disciplines or subjects or organ systems with your curriculum, but if you have some flexibility, uh, especially during the dedicated time periods, um, some of those, you know, uh, and, and, all, and, and even though you want to avoid cramming, towards the very end, you're going to do a little bit of cramming. And the ones, the subjects that do tend to be a little bit more crammable is micropharmacology and uh, metabolic pathways, you know, that type of stuff. Uh, the other piece of advice is, uh, um, is basically focus on what you learned in medical school first. Uh, that was high yield. Um, uh, that's reinforced by high yield resources like first aid before you learn something completely new. And then, as I mentioned, you know, you got to stay relaxed. You got to keep the long view in mind, uh, you know, in order to, um, you know, uh, you know, get the best results. So I'm going to pause there. I'm going to ask Sean and Paris uh, if you guys have any advice that you often uh, provide to uh, to other students uh, as 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 our coaches. So one of the things we've seen recently is. A lot of students are very reluctant to take an NBME or an assessment until they feel like they can get a high enough score. Uh, remember, assessments are there, yes, for predictive value, but they're also there so you can use them as a tool to assess your strengths and weaknesses so that you can plan your studying accordingly. So keep that in mind. Use it as a tool. Don't be afraid of the score from the very beginning. Uh, it can be very helpful if you utilize it early. Great. Excellent, Sean. Uh, Paris, do you have any words of wisdom? Yeah, and I think going, um, trying to tie all of these things in together is trying to come up with a good approach to studying and to answering questions. Um, and I think that's something that a lot of medical students have questions with is how should I be going about my studying process? How should I be approaching these questions? Um, and I think that's something that we uh, potentially can talk about later um, and can provide help with as well. Great, fantastic. All right, let's keep on going. Uh, we're, we're, we're getting towards the tail end here and uh, that raffle as well. Uh, so uh, a, a couple of things with regards to uh, the, the, the USMLE. The USMLE is, a C, is you know, in, their, in their vernacular, is a CBT, computer-based test. Uh, so again, as I mentioned, do that tutorial. Uh, and uh, before you get to the ProMetra Test Center, you can get those 15 minutes. There are some keyboard shortcuts for uh, some of you. Most people don't use it, but I just put it there out there just in case. And then, as I mentioned, you know, you want to test yourself, uh, you know, as much uh, as much as possible. And the key thing is to do Q and A all the way through. And in fact, that's what Paris and you know Sean do a lot with uh, with, with 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 the folks that they coach. And there's actually a lot of science behind that. Um, uh, there was a major paper published in the journal Science. Uh, several years ago, and it actually made the front page of the, the New York Science section, uh, and it talks about learning through testing. So the idea is that testing is not only good for figuring out how much you know, but it turns out the more you test yourself, 
the more that you actually learn. And they figured that out by randomizing uh, college students to several uh, study methods. That included uh, studying something once, uh, concept method, which is basically mind mapping, uh, studying something several times within the same time period, and then uh, retrieval practice, which is basically self-testing. As you can see here, people who self-tested themselves, so did quizzes, self-quizzed themselves, you know, they actually did better. You can see that they did something like 20 to 30 percent better, or maybe even doubled, if you uh, even those who like, you know, crammed all the time. And even if it's the questions were more indirect, like inference questions, they still did 10 to 15 percent better. So the bottom line is, uh, 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 you know, self-testing works. Uh, and when we have surveyed students in the past and IMGs in the past and asked them, you know, what, what one thing they would have done if they had to do it all over again, you know, which hopefully nobody has to, uh, the majority of them said that they would, they would have done more questions uh, and, and learn from those questions. And so doing questions and learning from questions is, is an excellent way to learn. All right, so if you want to do that, well, what are your options? Well, obviously there's, there's the USMLE itself. USMLE provides a sample test, 120 items. It's helpful for that format familiarity. Uh, then there's the NBE uh, CBSSA. That's a comprehensive basic science self-assessment. You can go to nbme.org uh, to, uh, to get to those. There's about six, seven forms, as Sean mentioned, that are out there. They're, they're about you know, 40 to 60 bucks a piece. Um, you can have access to them for a couple of months. Uh, uh, you know, they, they have, uh, you know, uh, about 160 questions in them or something like that. And they're really good for benchmarking yourself uh, because they do correlate with the uh, USLing Step 1. Uh, and then there are question banks, you know, so like USLing RX, uh, UWorld, uh, you know, uh, Kaplan and so forth. And these are good for, you know, uh, you know, practice and study. And you can also simulate you know, uh, exams as well too. For example, uh, in USLRX, you can, set, you can set aside 280 questions and do a full day simulation if you want to. We also have two self-assessments as well that you can use on top of the, the, the simulation option in USLRX. Now, what's the research about QBanks and uh, how well do they perform? So it turns out that in addition to, you know, that, you know, um, what I showed you in the journal Science, Turns out that in the medical literature, uh, QBanks are effective. They tend to be more effective than flashcards. Uh, that's not a surprise, right? Because question banks, you know, look and behave like the real thing, right? You know, if they're done well. Uh, you know, uh, so the next question is, well, how effective are they? Uh, it turns out that um, depending on the literature or the research, uh, the study you look at, you have to do anywhere between 300 and 450 questions, uh, you know, unique questions, not repeat questions, to uh, get one additional uh, extra point on the boards, keeping everything equal. Uh, how many questions should you do? We actually don't know uh, the actual answer, but it appears to be that the more, the better so far. Um, so in the one study out of the University of Michigan, uh, students uh, at the University of Michigan who did more than 3,200 questions did better than their classmates who did less than 3,200 questions. Um, in the very, very same study, it also turns out that, you know, students who did unique questions, so they did repeat questions, did better than those who repeated this, uh, the multiple choice questions, which is, again, why I recommend that you're going to probably do, need to do more than one question bank, because if you just try to do the same question bank three times, uh, it's not going to be as useful as doing three different question banks. Lastly, and again, this is out of the Michigan study, which we had nothing to do with, Students who did at least three passes in first aid did better than students who did not. Uh, so that's some of the research uh, that, that we are aware of. All right, uh, some test day tips. A couple of things to keep in mind. Uh, on test day, you are gonna be jacked up. So keep, keep those stimulants in check. Uh, you will be uh, going to a office building. A lot of these office buildings have the aircon max on, uh, you know, even during the summertime. So come in with layered clothing. If it get if the sun comes to your side of the building, there's direct sunlight, uh, then you can you can uh, adjust your clothing for comfort. Um, some of the questions can have a lengthy 
stem or a big story. And so you run into those, you might want to, you know, look at the question first, uh, scan the distractors, then go through the stem looking for, um, uh, you know, for, uh, for clues. Uh, managing the clock, uh, there is, again, 40 questions in 60 minutes. That works out to 90 seconds per question. Uh, as a general rule of thumb, uh, I typically advise students, and I think Sean Perez does as well too, that you want to, you know, make, you know, uh, you know, commit to an answer uh, probably within 70 to 75 seconds. Uh, so that way, uh, that will, will allow you to get through all 40 questions, uh, you know, with some time left on the clock, maybe, you know, eight to, you know, any, anywhere between uh, five to 10 minutes. And then uh, if you marked off a number, a reasonable number of questions that you're, you were unsure of, but you think can be solvable, you can go back to try to solve some of those questions. Um, we talked about uh, the fact that uh, they, you know, you have uh, an hour break, you know, that you can, you know, slice up, you know, during the day. So, uh, you know, um, you know, there's no right or wrong answer. Uh, some people go two blocks, take a break, two blocks, take a break, two blocks, take a break. Uh, some people go three blocks, then take a light lunch, uh, uh, and then two blocks. And so it really just depends on your stamina and so forth. Uh, uh, you know, uh, if again, if you want to kind of uh, get a better sense of your energy level, you could, in US RX, if you're using that, you can uh, do a full day simulation, uh, you know, run out the clock and see, see when you might want to space your breaks. Um, uh, when I was a medical student, uh, we had this joke called the C reflex in our study group. Uh, you know, the context, of course, is that on the USLE step one, you know, there are going to be some easy questions. Thank you. Thankfully, there will be some, you know, uh, you know, challenging questions, and there are going to be some questions you have absolutely no idea what's going on. Uh, and so you, you you can't worry about those questions. And so if you cannot uh, eliminate any of the distractors, you know, uh, reason them out, then uh, you know, have a have an answer in the back of your head, C, B, whatever, mark that and go on. Uh, a couple of things, you know, to keep in mind with that, you know, one is obviously there's 279 other, you know, uh, other questions that you can tackle, right? And you don't want to lose too much time. Uh, second of all, uh, the US Wayne does have uh, um, uh, uh, experimental questions uh, that they sometimes slip in there. So not all of the questions are necessarily going to count. And so hopefully one of those questions that you don't have, you have no clues going in, uh, going on is, is just a uh, experimental question. So there you go. Um, those are some test tips uh, um, and hopefully that will help you out.